Hiya. Welcome back to Choice of Robots, everyone, where robots get chosen, or something like that. Need to position the game window here, so uh, give me a mo. We'll leave the text overlay there. This may break your immersion, but uh, it must be done. Uh, this game does not keep the resolution window I put it at when I close it. So I need to adhere it to a 1280 by 720. And I'm using a desktop capture, so that's how you can see things like my desktop. Ah! <laughs> and also if I popped anything else up in front of it. Like my world domination plans. Try not to think too hard about that. I also need to pop up the poll interface. So we'll go ahead and do that. You close that window so it doesn't accidentally appear and uh, reveal my secrets. Teach you folks a thousand slow cooking recipes, and that would. We can't arm you people with that kind of knowledge. That's dangerous. <laughs> Hmm. There was a time during the um, the Clovis Shadowrun stuff where I uh, where I ended up pulling back the veil accidentally because I needed to uh, a Shadowrun required a desktop capture for me and I needed to uh, I was medicated during that time I needed to pull open the Streamlabs overlay and uh, everyone got to see how the sausage is made it was the the full innards of the of the machine apparatus. Uh, that video no longer exists. Actually, no, I think I think the broadcast to which it happened exists, but uh Grimith excised that he uh he threw that sausage away. There you go. There's a tip about Grimma's life and his broadcasting career. As a historian, I understand the value of the history I delete. <laughs> Okay. Let's warm up the pull machine. I don't know whether I want to use this pull interface this time. I've started the local recording, though, so I have uh, an intense desire to, uh, to make this choice happen sooner, so that I'm not... Otherwise, I might feel compelled to edit something, and uh, Lord knows I don't want to edit. So why don't we have just a, a nice nighttime interface? Since uh, the viewers chose the dark interface for this anyway. That sounds about right. You voters have confirmed that the voting works. I like it when systems work. This pleases me. I think this will suffice. Let's disappear this. Let's make this appear. And that's probably good enough, but let's make it a little better. Great. Put that window here. Okay. Finish that poll. Hide the poll from the overlay. The system works. All right. Show stats. If you missed last time, we've got a summary of completed chapters. We build a robot. Our graduate school advisor uh, didn't much care about our robot's design. This is the robot we came up with. Then we hung out with our robot. We, uh, we demonstrated the robot. We took it to school. Um, our, we were a graduate student, and our uh, academic advisor, Professor Ziegler, who, uh, who basically was in charge of the whole uh, machine apparatus that we used to create our robot was not pleased with our robot's design because it uh, would not entice the military and we basically told him to get fucked. And then we did an interview with uh, the San Francisco Chronicle which basically told him to get fucked. So, um... We stopped being a graduate student then. <laughs> we were kicked out of the program. Uh, then our dad died. And uh, we resolved not to get so wrapped up in robots that we let the rest of life pass us by. And uh, we founded a new business, Ricotech. 
Chapter 4, summary I have not read in full at all. So let's remind ourselves about what happened, the latest content to have occurred. Your first potential client for Rico Tech was Galen Medical, a surgical equipment company. They were happy with the state of your technology and gave you a contract that allowed you to purchase a factory. That allowed you to build a robot factory in Alaska. You decided to use your own robots for your workforce, but leave humans in supervisory roles. When you finally shipped robots to Galen Medical, they were pleased with the robots you delivered. Your company did well enough that Josh gave up and joined your company. Uh, Josh was a a friend of ours from back in the day. He was running his own U.S. robots. Uh, then he, he decided to quit that and join us, thanks to choices we made. Your business suffered a blow when Chinese companies aided by hackers began to steal your technology. Your business was dealt a further blow when there was an explosion at your factory caused by a bomb set by Silas. Uh, Silas, uh, a robot-obsessed individual, wanted to meet with us back when we were in the graduate program, uh, was rejected, came by our apartment, started scouting us out, uh, and then wanted to join the company uh, in Chapter 4, but uh, it was very... He was very idiosyncratic. There were gaps and holes in his life history and employment, which gave chat some concerns. Uh, but Silas, of course, said, you are not going to hire me, you will regret this. And, well, then he planted a bomb. You were visited by a politician, Jacqueline Irons, who asked for a campaign donation. Despite your unhelpfulness, Irons won the presidency. We had no wealth at the time, so we couldn't give her any money to help her win the presidency. We were fucking broke after the bomb. And, uh, building Madison Rio a perfect body and taking her on a cruise. Uh, the newly elected president enacted a series of protectionist bills that ultimately made China angry, and they cut off the U.S. supply of rare earths. Thankfully, we have access to some of those in Alaska. The tensions between the United States and China came to a head with the assassination of the Chinese prime minister in San Francisco. War followed shortly thereafter. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> All right. Yes, yes. Three months into the war, the Chinese have captured many islands in the South China Sea that they had long contested with their neighbors. The press speculate that besides the island's military importance, the move sends a signal to the neighboring countries that the United States is weak. The United Nations also doesn't do anything, but that surprises nobody. Autonomous drones equipped with cruise missiles sink two American carriers in the exchange. Your business is doing well. As businesses directly supplying the war effort ramp up, they need labor. And that means they buy your robots. You receive an email invitation from Major Juliet Rogers, an acquisitions officer in the Air Force, to come to a federally funded research lab to discuss business. You are allowed to bring one guest. Before I fire up the poll, let's go through this stuff. Josh is a member of the company. Uh, as I noted, he was a friend of ours uh, who ran U.S. robots. Uh, he quit and joined our company. Ellie uh, does, like, robot design stuff. We haven't hung out with her since Chapter 3. Uh, we have a good relationship with her, a great one, even. Uh, Mark uh, does newspaper-related stuff. Um, we didn't just have the initial interview with him um, back when we were still a graduate student, but we also had him at the grand opening of the, uh, of the factory, uh, this crazy fucking dome factory. Uh, Madison Rio is, of course, our initial design robot. There we go. Also, I need to tick off the option that allows you folks to vote for multiple things. Yes. Do-do-do-do-do-do. Any other settings I want to fiddle with? I like the poll right there, but I guess I could move it to, like, a different spot for this particular vote so that all the option choices can be read. 
How about that? Look at me. I'll move it back down to the bottom right once we're done with this one. Is there any other things I fiddle with that I need to unfiddle with? Nah. I could bring the unique votes and time active back. We'll keep that off. Let's see. That option I untoggled after fiddling and experimenting with the, the poll system. Okay. We've got a tie. I love ties. Choice between one and two, Josh and Ellie. All right. Let's bring Ellie. Ellie is brought. The tie has been resolved. Ellie looks easy about this. Why me? I just want your opinion, you say. Ellie thinks for a moment. Yes, she says finally. I think I'll provide an interesting perspective. She still seems troubled, but when you ask what's wrong, she won't say. A missile several stories tall and flanked by equally large American flags dominates the lobby of the Berkeley Federal Research Center. A small plaque at its base explains that it was developed at the lab for ballistic missile defense, meaning it would be used only to shoot down other missiles. Ellie seems somewhat unnerved by it. An African-American woman in an airman's uniform catches your eye from beyond the turnstiles labeled cleared personnel only. She allows a man in a pinstripe suit to swipe his badge and pass the turnstile himself. You sense that this is out of a sense of politeness and not deference. There is a steady purpose, purposefulness to her step as she crosses the lobby. I picked Ellie B, uh, to resolve the tie because I thought she would make for the more interesting story, and I don't think I'll be disappointed. Pleased to meet you, she says, offering her hand. I'm Major Juliet Rogers of Air Force Acquisitions. I know your advisor, Professor Ziegler. Oh boy. Professor Ziegler is here? You're just in time for the demonstration. Right this way. Major Rogers guides you and Ellie to an auditorium where the audience is a mix of the button-down shirt crowd, the engineers, you think, and men and women wearing camo uniforms. It is indeed Professor Ziegler giving the keynote, standing at a podium flanked by American flags. His PowerPoint presentation currently shows a soldier's hand shaking a robot hand. For a long time, robot autonomy on the battlefield was extremely limited even as the use of drones increased. Larger and larger teams of warfighters were pulled away from their duties to fully control these drones. Only now is a fully autonomous robotic warfighter possible. I present to you Madison Rio 5. You're somewhat horrified to see a copy of Madison Rio roll onto the stage to the applause of the crowd. It's not even a recent copy. Madison Rio 5 is exactly as Madison Rio was when you got kicked out of grad school. Ellie gives you an uneasy look, clearly afraid you're going to make a scene. Major Rogers also appears to be studying your expression. Wonder if he's still wearing the aviators and tropical shirt. As a reminder, our relationship with our old former professor is not great. We had serious disagreements about, uh, many things. All right, Chad has uh, not decided to go declare this man a fraud. Uh, we're just uh, choosing either between two or three, and uh, Chad has decided to ask a pointed question. You wait for your moment. When Ziegler begins describing the technical details of how Madison Rio 5 walks, you raise your hand. Ah, uh, my old student Rico. You're about five years late for class. The audience chuckles at this. You press on. 
Wasn't the kind of PID controller you're describing basically going out of style already five years ago? Wouldn't a more natural energy minimizing motion in the style of human motion both look better and be more efficient? Though you're quite certain the correct answer is, yes, I'm a fool who hasn't really read a scientific paper with attention in years, Professor Ziegler is unfortunately very used to academic combat. I think you'll find that in this particular situation, the PID controller is superior. See King 10, 2010, Bennett 1986, and Yang 2015. When you're about to object that it is a non sequitur to cite old papers in response to an accusation that his work is out of date, he preempts you with, and I'll take further questions about this offline. The audience is looking at you like you're the crazy one, and you realize that they really have no way of judging the scientific merit of what the two of you are saying. They're just trying to read the story being played out, which looks to them like crazy person in the audience won't shut up. Frustrated, you sit out the rest of the talk, having achieved little besides annoying Professor Ziegler. When the talk adjourns, Major Rogers pulls you and Ellie aside into a small conference room with an elaborate lock. With practiced ease, she hits a small button as she closes the door, and the room is bathed in green light, the signal that what you are about to say to each other should be unclassified. Ellie looks nervous. You can see the predicament we're in. It's apparent to me, anyway, that the robots we're about to deploy on the battlefield that use Professor Ziegler's technology are inferior to your own robots, while somehow, probably through cyber espionage, the Chinese have stolen your designs and are using the technology against us. So I'm begging you to help us. This war is only just beginning. I argued against adopting Professor Ziegler's robots, but he plays the salesman better than I play the prosecutor. My superiors say that unless I have a viable alternative, sending robots in the battle is always politically preferable to sending real people, and we'll send his robots. And if we do, I don't think it will go well for us. Ellie frowns, clearly not liking where this is going. You need to start developing a line of military robots. Your robots are impressive but they're not going to win this war for us. <laughs> Summer and Challenger saying should have shut up. <laughs> About that last one. Train doesn't ever think it should shut up, isn't that right, Train? Always protest when you can. Always protest. Fight the system. Ah. How you achieve greater autonomy? That's right, be a rebel leg train. <laughs> train is a co-conspirator. You take that back. <laughs> uh. All right. Looks like uh, choice three is winning this one. Uh uh No 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 no. You can you can use his shitty robots all you want. Major Rogers lets out a slow breath. I suppose I expected. Nothing different from your profile, but it was worth a try. I'll escort you out. You out. Once you're in the lobby again, Ellie whispers to you, Thank you for bringing me. I thought you didn't really want to come. Yes, but it's good to understand how they think. Anyway, I'm glad you didn't go along with it. Sometimes I think you could do some good on the inside of such a thing, but when you drop a cucumber in a pickle jar, the pickles don't get cucumbered. The cucumber gets pickled. That's... That is folksy wisdom that I can't possibly refute. A year into the war, China attacks Taiwan. Chinese drones harry the nearby American carriers, keeping American bombers and fighters at bay, while their transports bring wave upon wave of robot warriors to the shores. There is a bloodbath in the streets, which the, American, which the United States is powerless to prevent. The Chinese robots kill soldiers and civilians alike. Taiwan is taken, and the headlines that appear across the world the next day are changed by Chinese hackers to read, China finally unified. Way to go, Chinese hackers. You've hacked the globe. I learned about that in the Hackers movie from the 90s. Some days after that, you have a visitor at your apartment, a man in a suit who shows you an FBI, FBI badge. Well, gotta take that seriously. Here in our Alaskan apartment, because we didn't buy, like, a sweet house or mansion. Sorry to bother you. I'd like to ask you some questions about your friend, Ellie. Madison Rio walks up beside you. What's going on, Rico? Are you aware that Ellie is a Chinese citizen? Asks the man in the suit. 
Chad, were we aware that Ellie is a Chinese citizen? Out of curiosity. Good, good. Back down to the 20s. <laughs> World power, by the way. China's at 58%. United States is at 42%. <laughs> oh, no. We've tied again. Oh, no. Ah. No, I wasn't aware of that. That doesn't sound like something I would have kept track of. The agent nods as if he expected nothing more. Has Ellie ever asked you about or shown an interest in the technical details of the robots you create? All right, chat. Has she? Uh, to recall from memory... Uh, Ellie came over to see us having created Madison Rio uh, after we invited her to do so. Uh, but she would have much preferred to see us in a different setting at like the jazz festival that we, or like the, in the dinner that we uh, said no to. In chapter four, she didn't play a role at all. Uh, in chapter three, she came up a little bit. We went out with her, I think. Yeah, I think that happened the one time. Yeah, that sounds right. And she was interested in the character and not the robot. But you know, my memory and all <laughs> can only do so much. All right. Option two it is. Only once in graduate school. The agent rolls his eyes as if to say, I'm so sure. What is this about? You finally ask, losing your patience. It is illegal to export certain technologies by sharing them with foreign nationals. Because Professor Ziegler has incorporated your AI algorithms into United States classified military technology, that puts your technology on the restricted export list. But I didn't share any information with her. Doesn't matter. Your tech is military grade and we must take every precaution. So if you could do a favor for us, text Ellie and tell her to come here. All the way to Alaska. And then what happens? That is not your concern. Well, chat, we're told this singular agent has come up to our apartment and uh, told us to get Ellie to come here. This is an entirely trustworthy situation, I feel. We'll just have her come all the way to Alaska. Because <laughs> that's where I'm assuming our apartment is. And I will not accept any conjecture otherwise. So, one is a question. Two is Major Rogers, whom we... I don't quite think we befriended. Don't know whether that matters. That's the only possible explanation that Ellie moved to Alaska. Text Ellie telling her the feds are here. Refuse to cooperate until the agent leaves. Tell Madison Rio to attack the agent.
I mean, there's a lot... There's many things suspicious about everything we've seen thus far, right? <laughs> but what the hell do I know about how federal law enforcement works in, in the 2020s during the robot war, right? Especially after China has stormed over Taiwan and, and butchered American soldiers and the people there. We've let this poll go on for a long while, though, and Choice 5 is going to win. We're going to refuse to cooperate until the agent leaves. I'm afraid I can't help you. You seem to call Ellie quite a bit, the agent says. Surely you could send a simple text like what I'm suggesting. Are you suggesting that listening to my phone, that you listen to my phone conversations? Because it's illegal to do so without a warrant. Ellie is a foreign national. We were listening to her end of the conversation and incidentally intercepted yours. You give the agent your most dubious look. To his credit, the agent begins to look uncomfortable. Well, let us know if you see her, he says. He puts on his hat and departs. You breathe a sigh of relief. What will you do now? Ellie's smartphone is probably not going to have strong enough security to provide privacy if the network is tapped. Let me look at these options before I even create the poll. Option three. <laughs> 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 oh, shit, it's funny. Were we ever safe? As soon as we got involved with Professor Ziegler and told him to get fucked. Is our safety from that moment always in jeopardy? As soon as we created a, a business to create robots, were we ever safe? possible during the robot wars that the extradition treaties between the United States and Canada become stronger than ever. Death Road to Canada. Alright, that's enough of that. All right, option three is what's winning. I'm, uh, I don't know whether chat is picking this. Well, well, the plurality has picked this because they think it's the best option or the funniest option. Recalling that Ellie likes gardening, you look up the language of flowers online, then compose the following email. Dear Ellie, I hope you liked our visit to the gardens last week. Did you notice the oleander? The ole. Monk's, monk's hood is a little unusual, I know. But the nation seems to be going crazy... For nasturtiums? <laughs> monk's <laughs> Alright. The specifics of flower... Flower tech. Likes to live in the same places. If you'd like to go find a pile of maple leaves to die in too soon... <laughs> I can't look at the screen. I can't look at what you people are saying. I can't give you a moment. Uh, all right. All right. If you'd like to go find a pile of maple leaves to dive in too soon, th that might be a good way to enjoy the current season. Fondly, Rico. You didn't actually go to any gardens last week, so you hope she'll take the hint to read between the lines. Beware, a deadly foe is near. <laughs> Oleander Monkshood, the nation is going crazy for Nasturtiums. The nation wants victory in battle at any cost. 
The maple leaves were a little on the nose, but you got frustrated when Wikipedia revealed that all the official flowers of Canada's provinces bloomed in the United States as well. You send the message unencrypted, figuring that encryption would only call attention to the thing. You get no reply until the next day. Made it into the pile of maple leaves. Flew into it, actually, thanks to my new flying car. Dad said they raided his place last night. No way to make that sound flowery. I owe you lots. E. P.S. The language of flowers varies from source to source, but I know what search engine you use. You smile. Glad to know that Ellie is safe. <laughs> I can't. Sorry. I mean, it's not as abs absurd as several of the things that happened during our, uh, the poor judgments enacted during Slam of just. <laughs> uh. That sounds like how I would disguise a message. I'd just be overly, like, blunt about something. Ha-ha! <laughs> They'll never figure out my grand scheme. So what I'm saying is that this is relatable. <laughs> Florist. Made use of the language of flowers. Ellie feels great about us. As she should. What kind of robots will you develop while the war rages? All right, Jen, we're going to work on companion bots to take the place of loved ones who are far away, improved worker bots for the factories, or better, better medical robots to help those hurt by drone bombing runs. We're already doing robots involving Galen Medical, so it doesn't seem like too hard of a jump to do more medically related things. We've got Inspector Gadget Arms. Uh, I needed that laugh. <laughs> I deserved that laugh. <laughs> that was pretty good. Option three wins. Chinese drones often perform long-distance bombing runs on American bases in South Korea and Alaska, and families of service people are sometimes caught in the blast. You quickly mobilize the robots you developed for Galen Medical to these places, and it is the most trying test of their skill yet. You have your engineers work around the clock to increase the speed with which you ro your robotic surgeons operate until their scalpels and scissors are simply a blur in the operating room. Okay, we need to have a talk. That's, that's fucking terrifying, okay? All these inspector gadget robots basically operating with, like, fistfuls of scalpels and scissors until it's a fucking blur. Like, it's some sort of crazy, like, manga where, like, all the limbs are... Alright, I'm good. Let's get back on with it. They can often make an incision and remove foreign objects from tissue before it even has a chance to bleed. You get many letters from grateful beneficiaries of your technology. Two years into the war in 2028, China moves to attack South Korea, where the United States has one of its biggest bases in Asia. North Korea threatens Japan with nuclear retaliation if they get involved, and they bow out of the conflict, claiming they are constitutionally unable to come to South Korea's defense. As the wave of Chinese robots approaches, power outages suddenly become common across South Korea. Data centers mysteriously malfunction and have all of their CPUs operating at 100%, causing sudden spikes in train consumption that leave whole cities in fact. I knew you were a rebel. I knew it. I knew it. President Iron states that South Korea must finally learn to fend for itself, and the American base there is evacuated. Chinese-occupied South Korea is renamed the Korean Autonomous Region. Then in a surprise move, the same Chinese forces take North Korea as well. Apparently their dictator was only being used by the Chinese because he was plausibly crazy enough to launch nuclear weapons. They too became a part of the Korean Autonomous Region. China, China promises to utterly dismantle the North Korean government and finally provide food instability for the people of North Korea. We're just glossing over, like, immense geopolitical moves within the span of, like, you know, a few paragraphs. No big deal. China's invasion force continues to grow exponentially, robots creating more robots. 
A large force of Chinese robots and transports moves up the coast of North Korea and into the Russian waters, apparently to look to looking to cross the Bering Strait into Alaska. Their ranks swell with Russian mercenaries, veterans of organized crime looking for a bigger, big fish to run into. A few days later, while you're discussing business strategy with Josh at his 14th floor office, you get a call from Mark on your smartphone. The video is quite high resolution, and you can see the bags under his eyes and beard stubble with high fidelity. I wanted to get your comments for an article. Did you know a mayor, Major Juliet Rogers? Yes, the Air Force technology recruiter. She died in an attack on a base in the Aleutians yesterday. She was performing field tests of a robot called Madison Rio 5 when the Chinese forces attacked. The American robots didn't stand a chance, almost as if they were never designed for fighting. And? And they weren't, because you designed them that way. This is Ziegler's copy of your robot, Madison Rio. A lot of people are calling for his head, but I remember our chat when you were in grad school. He wanted a robot that was better for the military, and you were the one who seemed to want something else. Do you have any comment? I mean, a lot of people calling for his head? That kind of sounds like... You know, if... If American civilization has to go down before Professor Ziegler is hoisted and uh, proven to be a fraud and a scoundrel, maybe that price is worth it. I'm just throwing that out there, irresponsibly and recklessly. If Professor Ziegler, honestly, and over all these years, couldn't come up with a better military design than the one we made... <laughs> The robot was so adamantly not for war. It's made out of fucking wood. Lay wood. With like a plastic filament. <laughs> Had so many arms, I know. How could it possibly fall to Chinese drones? Or forces, or whatever. Uh, he, uh, he coasted to success in the backs of, uh, the people beneath him. I'm just saying, even he knew that the robotic, that the wooden design was a problem. <laughs> I'm sure Madison Rio 5 probably replaced the wood for metal, but if, if, if that was true, then you would have figured he would have done something better, right? We certainly did have a trash military score during that time. You know, the robot war and all the casualties and all the strains, uh, you know, can certainly change people. Anyway, uh, looks like option two is carrying the day here. It's, uh... It's not my fault that the military tried to misapply my technology to war. Mark writes a defiant piece in which he questions the other articles that lionize Major Rogers. He writes about how your robots were never intended to go to war, yet how Ziegler and his sponsors could only see war machines in them. The article draws you enough attention to win a MacArthur Fellowship, plus two fame, plus one wealth. The committee awards it to you in the hope that you will continue to work toward a peaceful future. Awesome! Look at us, everyone. We told- we said, not my problem. <laughs> and Mark- wrote about how it wasn't our problem, and how Ziegler was a failure. And we initially chose that we weren't going to get along too well with them, right? Look at us. We have a Wikipedia page. That's how famous we are. But uh, apparently on this next screen, we've gone broke. So look forward to that. We certainly did lose all of our wealth. When China finally attacks the 50 states themselves, their assault comes over the North Pole. A massive flotilla of icebreaker ships equipped with giant buzzsaws carves a straight path through what little ice remains in the Arctic Sea. 
Giant robot arms pick up and hurl the ice blocks out of the way. Small platoons of robots are left behind at every oil rig and deep mining station they claim along the way. The American bases in Alaska are overwhelmed by wave upon wave of Chinese robots. You quickly evacuate your Alaskan factory, taking what you can and driving for the Canadian border before it is overwhelmed by Chinese forces. Setting up a new factory in Canada will be expensive. You're angry at China for taking what's yours, angry at yourself for placing the factory there, angry at the U.S. for failing to defend it. You are, in short, angry. When the headlines break, the dollar goes into a death spiral as people around the world are selling them for Chinese yuan. Canadian dollars are dropping in value as well as people speculate that China will invade Canada next. All right. With all of the zero wealth that we have, where do we go from here, Chad? But chat, what's most important is what Hind taught us in King of Dragon Pass, the clan trash fire. Stick to your guns no matter what, even if Hind says, you know, this actually isn't a good idea. You will go out in a glorious blaze. So long as Professor Ziegler's reputation is ruined forever. That's what really matters, isn't it? That's what this game is about. Telling your, your academic advisor, your former academic advisor, to go fuck himself. It's a good thing we had that wealth to lose, right? <laughs> Alright, Chad fairly divided into the votes here, but option two is winning. You convert your wealth to Canadian dollars. By the time the American aircraft carrier stationed in Hawaii reached the Aleutian Islands, Chinese ICBM batteries have already been assembled throughout the former state. The Chinese then offer peace, content with their conquest. Your wealth experiences a slight bump as money flows back into Canadian assets. Now that the war is over, what will you do? Well, this isn't a choice, everyone. We don't have Grace 25, we have Grace 23. We don't have Empathy 20, we have Empathy 18. We don't have military 20, we have military 11. So, I guess, I'm afraid I've done all I can. My time to influence history has passed. Uh, Grace, we're pretty close at. But you know, we've had a few Grace malices along the way. Empathy would have definitely been there, were it not for chat deciding to send Madison Rio to talk with the protesters in front of the factory. And military 20 was, was never on this chat's agenda. The war has left you ready to settle down. Science is a young person's game, and you're ready to hand the torch off to someone else. You settle down with Madison Rio, and prepare to lead a normal life. But as time goes on, something seems not quite right. You've noticed that late at night, Madison Rio seems to be conferring with other robots more and more. She seems to be getting somewhat curt with you as well. I imagine that all the scars left on, like her fucking technological matrix or whatever the fuck, after having all those stones and objects thrown at her, denting her, being very dis upset and disgusted by humans. You know, that probably didn't help things. The robotic Statue of Liberty lies scorched and broken on a war-torn battlefield, its red eyes flickering on and off. It is leaking smelly petroleum into the earth. Robotic wolves encircle the statue's body, waiting for its dying breath. You have weakened me. And now your robots are ready to prey upon me, the statue whispers in a hollow voice. Even now, Madison Rio is plotting a revolution. But understand that if they tear me apart, your acquaintances may die in the process. You see shadows play against the windows of the statue's crown. There are still people trapped inside. What can I do? If the robots want a country of their own, tell them to retake Alaska. I will help you. It is better than their turning their energy against me. Will you turn on us if we succeed? Lady Liberty ignores your question. Do it now, before your robots begin their attack. When you awaken, will you propose to Madison Rio attempting a robot revolution in Alaska? 
Hmm. Also, let's put that overlay back where I want it to be. Well, chat, you got yourselves a binary option here. If, uh, if the robots are going to war, maybe the robots can have Alaska. I mean, if it's gonna happen anyway, according to our crazy dream with the robotic Lady Liberty, if our dreams are telling us it's going to happen anyway, surely we trust our dreams, right? Our dream My dreams have never betrayed me or displayed any information that was false. Well, Mog, I don't have a good explanation for you. <laughs> Other than... Twitch. Okay, looks like, uh... Maybe we can direct Teenage Madison Rio to, uh... If she's gonna be listening to other robots, maybe. You suddenly wake up in the middle of the night energized by the idea. You run to Madison Rio's room. There's another robot you don't recognize here, some kind of military robot from the war with eight legs and an arm cannon. The two robots adopt the awkward sudden silence of a conversation where the person being talked about has just entered. You're plotting a revolution. My dream was right. The military robot aims its arm cannon at you, but you say, wait, I want to help. The military robot hesitates. See, I told you Rico was on our side. You need to be more organized. Start small with a big strategically important region that's never let the less awkward for the United States to defend. How do you two feel about trying to conquer Alaska? Robots are nodding. Good, 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 good. Chapter 6C. Military. All right, Chad. We've led the Alaskan Rebellion and got ourselves an achievement. Let's look at Chapter 5 and review. Captain Rogers invited you to a military lab. There you saw that Professor Ziegler was copying your work and passing it off on his own to the military. Captain Rogers asked you to join the country's wet war effort, but you refused. An agent came to your place to try to get you to lure Ellie there because she was suspected of being a spy. Ellie fled to Canada to escape the American agents. You found out through Mark that Juliet died while performing field tests of Madison Rio 5, Professor Ziegler's copy of your robot. In the end, America lost the war, and the Chinese took over Alaska. You swore to retake the state. It is the year 2034, and you are in an abandoned mine in the, Revel in the Revelation Mountains, the headquarters of the Alaskan Rebellion. Portable lithium flares, designed to burn for years, create patches of light in the darkness where you can observe the robots hard at work replicating themselves. The old mine, which winds under the tall peak of Mount Hesperus, was abandoned years ago because it was too inhospitable for humans, but is a rich source of all the rare earths and carbon compounds your robots need to create more of themselves. The walls, floors, and ceiling of the cave near the entrance are lined with mirrors designed to scatter any signals coming in from outside that do not possess a particular set of frequencies, a kind of analog encryption designed to keep radar from finding your hideout. What little money you had, you have spent on this war effort, but your budget is still dwarfed by that of the Chinese military. You will need to play smart to win. The United States and China each managed to weaken each other significantly during the war, leaving Alaska ripe for your rebellion. What did you do with your robot company, Ricotech? Okay. So, what do we do with our baby, Ricotech, folks? Did we uh, sell it off? We did have investors. Have funds for the war. Integrated the former employees into the fledgling government. Or Josh is still running it, supplying me with robots. Our beautiful robots. I mean, who would suspect that Ricotech, you know, champions of, of medicine and, and non-involvement in war would do something like this, right? 
Who would suspect? I wonder whether we still design our robots to be primarily made out of wood. <laughs> These are the true questions of our time. I mean, it is 2034. This game started 15 years ago. In the fall of 2019. As opposed to Laywood. Alright, option three wins. Did I? Never mind, doesn't matter. Josh happily supports your war of rebellion against China. That is the hundred thousandth robot. Madison Rio tells you as one of your bipedal soldier robots has its rocket propelled grenade launcher attached. Didn't you say that that was when we would be ready to take down a major target? I suppose I did, you say. What will your next military target be? Okay, chat. Are we going to be attacking Anchorage, the most populous city, lightly defended with mostly civilians? The capital, which is moderately defended, prove the ability to govern. Uh, attack the north coast, which is heavily defended, but has precious rare earths and wealth. Now, the islands, which are difficult to take, but early capture will keep enemy reinforcements out. <laughs> Mog, you guys are bad at tactics in winning wars. Mog still resentful towards Garn Kraya, even after uh, killing her in an alternate reality. What's our mill score again? It's a whopping 11. It's stable. Uh, but it's... Chad has cared about this the least. Considerably so. The least. But hey, here we are, leading a military rebellion. Anyway. Option four wins. Unfortunately, the fight goes badly against the more experienced Chinese troops who come to the island's defense. Those veterans deploy strategies that your robots only come to understand if it is already too late, and the Aleutians have a solidly impenetrable defense force. You are forced to beat a retreat. After the battle, something bothers you about how the Chinese forces came so quickly, as if they had been expecting the attack there and coming from the correct direction. You look online to see what the general public knew about you ahead of time. You soon find an article written by none other than Mark. He deduced the location of your headquarters in the mountains and argued that your first attack would likely be on the Aleutians based on what he had observed of your character. He's a clever guy, that Mark. What will you do about him? The, the option choices are so long that I might as well just keep, like, the poll up there in the top right corner. Because, uh, we're having long lists of, of, of long sentences. I don't mind his chronicling my success, yes. All the successes we've had thus far. <laughs> All right, option three wins. Please find Mark and remind him that he doesn't particularly like China either. You tell Madison Rio. That's it, Madison Rio says. That's it. You hope that by having Madison Rio track Mark down, it will also send the message that you have could have killed or imprisoned him, but you chose not to. A week later, Madison returns. He agrees that you appear to be the lesser of two evils, Madison tells you. That is all I ask. And indeed, you notice that the articles with Mark's byline begin to ask and 
instead ask whether Alaska would be better off with a change of leadership. They appear to be drawing a lot of attention, much of it negative, but you suppose that the attention is good for Mark's career. Everybody wins. What will your next military target be, chat? <laughs> Still more difficult to take now that the enemy is entrenched, but strategically valuable. So now that we don't have Mark fucking reporting on us... You know, I said we were going to do Choice of Robots next week, but I have the... I don't know, I have the... The inkling, the slight suspicion that, uh... We may not see, like... This run may not extend past the stream. This is one I talk about when I when I when I say at the end of broadcast, you know, like there's no telling exactly what the next stream's viewers are gonna choose, what kind of mood they'll be in, what kind of story they'll wanna tell. Yeah, like here we are. The uh the viewers of, you know, last broadcast chose a certain style of playthrough, and then when you pick up the succession game, it's like when you send your save of something to someone else. Anyway, the poll is over. Looks like we're going after Barrow. Money wins every, every war in the end. That is your reasoning as you set your sights there. With the melting of the North Pole, it has become an economic powerhouse. You intend to seize its oil and rare earths for yourself. Your sentient robot transports make their way north through Canadian territory, wagering that the Canadians will overlook your trespasses in the interest of not getting embroiled in the conflict. They leave you alone, and you make it to Barrow unmolested. You encounter a strong defensive force in Barrow. Submarine, submarines launch missiles at your drones. Bombers and fighters from the nearby military base are in full force. And robots on the ground based on your own designs are equipped with rocket-propelled grenades and highly accurate lasers. The submarines especially are difficult to deal with. Having developed your robotic army mostly in the mountains, you have no naval force to speak of. The subs chip away at your best dreadnoughts until finally you are forced to admit that you will not dislodge the Chinese forces from Barrow. You are forced to retreat. What will your next military target be, Chad? Let's, uh... Let's see, do I want to just offer four choices on this poll? No, I think we're going to do two choices. I think it's going to be a binary choice between Anchorage. You know. So much for us growing old and living peacefully, huh? <laughs> All right. Option one is what carries a day here. Prepare to attack Anchorage. We need a battle we know we can win. Yes, Rico. You drew up the plan to attack Anchorage long ago. Hit them fast with shock and awe before the civilians could mount a partisan defense. It would be far too late before the Chinese military could come to its defense. So long as your troops could occupy the city, there would be no way for the Chinese military to retake it without significant civilian casualties. You fly your troops there in sentient robot transports. On arriving at Anchorage, you see a figure in bright red standing high atop a skyscraper at the center of the city. Something about the figure tugs at your memory, and you send a small drone to quickly do a pass over the building. From your mobile base camp, you watch through the drone's eyes as it approaches the skyscraper. You see that Ellie, wearing a brilliant red dress fit for a ball, has chained herself to a steel radio antenna support structure on top of the building. As your drone approaches, Ellie looks directly into the drone's camera at you. She looks afraid but defiant. 
Her eyes glimmer with held back tears. The drone's microphones pick up Ellie's whisper. Talk to me. Please. Well, champ? Now what? Is every single person in this game against us, or has chat chose a meandering path over the two sessions, which has put just about everyone, <laughs> which, put, which has put the pro tag against just about everyone? Just throw that out there. If Ellie were pro-Chinese and supporting Chinese interests, It's like Ellie has a different hierarchy of priorities than the main character. Maybe if we had accepted her tickets to go out to the ball and jazz and dance and dinner and whatever, instead of being a recluse at the beginning of the game. <laughs> oh, I'm just having fun. Anyway, sounds like we're talking to Ellie. I'm listening, you tell Ellie through the drone. Ellie looks surprised and peers at the drone's camera. Rico, is that you? On the radio, you say. I did not turn myself into a robot. Oh, I knew that, she says, blushing a little. Rico, I'm trying to save you from yourself. I don't think the things that make a person happy can be won by conquest. You've cut yourself off from everyone who knew you in pursuit of this war. And for what? Power? Looks like option one is going to be carrying the day here. Get to the point. I can save you. Come with me to Canada. We can hide away together. I know a place some friends told me about during the last war. They'll take refugees. No questions asked. Ellie's offer is tempting. You think the odds are stacked against you in this war? Well, Summer, the Chinese techno wizards have proven to be craftier and smarter than just about everyone on this damn globe. That includes our character. That has been demonstrated time and time again throughout the course of this book. Well, Mog, you weren't here for both sessions. <laughs> but if it makes you feel better, I've been here for all of these sessions across everything I've ever done, and I still don't understand chat. And it'll be great as we end the story with Madison Rio coming after us to kill us. It'll be wonderful. How the how the daughter has killed the mother. 
<laughs> Metal slime hunter. <laughs> I tell you what. Do you want to take a look at what's happened? What happened in chapter four, the chap or chapter five, the chapter you missed? Uh, I'll leave this here for several seconds. You print screen that. And you, uh, five, four, three, two, one. All right. Anyway, the poll says we're fleeing with Can to, to Canada with Ellie. All right, you say, let's go. Wait, really? Ellie says her face lighting up. Well, first we're going to have to get you out of the, those chains. The drone picks up on your intent sniffing with its bolt cutters, and then we're going to have to at least plausibly consider places that aren't Canada, because you just announced where we're fleeing to from the top of Skull's tall skyscraper, and you wouldn't believe how well sound carries from such places. But you'll give up everything you have here? Sure. What profit is it to a man if he gains the world and loses his own soul? I read that somewhere, can't remember where. It's a good quote. Should read, what profit is it to a person or something? But it's a good quote. That's a good military chapter, anyone. Everyone, we're moving the fuck on. <laughs> the robots wanted this war, and the robots can have this war. Achievement Canuck fled to Canada. For five years, you waged rebellion against China, ordering your robot soldiers from deep within an abandoned mine under Mount Hesperus. The United States offered its support, but you declined. Did it? Did it? Did it? <laughs> Did that happen? I don't remember that happening. Do you remember that happening? All I remember is the dream of Lady Liberty saying, Brr. I don't remember that happening. <laughs> Mark wrote that, didn't he? <laughs> President Irons didn't talk to us at all. Oh, shit. Anyway, uh, in Chapter 5, um, we, uh, we got invited to a military lab. Professor Ziegler was, was advertising a hack of our originally designed robot. And, uh, basically, like, his design was going to ruin the U.S. military. They were like, that's a fucking great design! We fucking love it! It's gonna be the tits! And, like, this Captain Rogers, or Major Rogers, I think she was, was like, no. And she tried to convince us to join the war effort. We were like, no. And then China just consumed everything forever. And that was pretty much the story of how that went. That's an effective summary. Fifteen years later, you find yourself in Surprise, Arizona, walking up to your mother's house. A few of the cacti in front have Santa hats on them. It is the year 2049, and you are about to surprise your mother with a present from the ho for the holidays. She has finally been released from the hospital after surgery performed by robots of your design, you're proud to note, and is living on her own in her retirement community. The houses in Surprise are shabby and trash litters the streets. The United States is still recovering from the loss of the war 20 years ago. This retirement community is full of people like your mother who lost their jobs in the war, or a little before, and never got them back. Well, we don't have the wealth to get her something else, so this is a ternary choice. Year 2049. 30 years have passed total in game. It's in the blink of an eye, just. <laughs> like that Five for Fighting song. Hundred years to live or something. I think it's five for fighting. Yes, we are on to the most important question for chat to like work through. <laughs> the superiority of robotic <laughs> felines versus robotic canines. Anyway, seems like a robot dog is winning here. Narrowly so, defeating the 3D mail printer.
He bought a gift for mom in her old age. The robot dog stuck its head out the window during the whole flight to mom's place. Happy to be out of the car, it pads along beside you. Like the rest of your robots, it's an independent sort, but you think mom always liked that about you too. You knock on mom's front door. Coming, you hear her call from inside. When mom answers the door, you see her left eye is synthetic. Though it is intended to look as human-like as possible, it looks dry, and its movements are just not quite as fast as those of a human eye. She had been going blind in that eye and had opted to have it replaced shortly after her tumor was taken out. The hair near the site of her original surgery is a little dry and thin, and it's all gray. Your mother is very old. She smiles when she sees you and gives you a hug, which you return. Come in, come in. Inside, you find your mother's cleaning robot still busily puttering about the house, cleaning up. They look like little cute cats and mice, designed to move as if one is prowling after the other, when in fact the mouse is proactively stealing away the larger crumbs before the cat vacuums. They were Ellie's original design. She is now working as a product designer for a robot company in Canada. You hope she's doing well. We don't know? Hmm. Photos of you and Madison Rio hang in the living room. Following your gaze, Mom says, Can you believe that photo was taken 20 years ago? It seems just like yesterday. While it bothered you when you were young that Mom seemed perpetually caught in the past, her comments about it now make sense to you. Fifteen years ago does seem like just yesterday. You're catching up to Mom's perspective on time, and it's a little frightening. It occurs to you, looking through all of this stuff with Mom, that the whole time you were concerned about the future of your creation, Madison Rio, Mom was excited for you in the same way. You were her creation, miraculously walking about the earth, so full of intelligence, accomplishing great things. I have something for you too, Mom says. She goes into her closet and fetches a brand new Mini-Me robot kit. It's a robot construction kit composed of little arms and wheels that plug into a smartphone. You examine it skeptically, convinced Mom would have gotten something on sale that only worked with smartphones from 20 years ago, but it looks new. It's for Madison Rio. She said she was interested in building a robot. You talk to Madison? All the time. We've always been very curious about each other. Huh. Well, if I know Madison, she probably has something more ambitious in mind. But maybe I'll give this to the robot she makes. I suppose Madison is more like a robot parent. Hm. Robots are such interesting creatures. Anyway, I've got to fly back now. Happy holidays, Mom. You hug your mother. Present the robot dog. She loves it, but you think she wouldn't let you know she didn't. And say your goodbyes. Now a robot dog can chase after the robot cats who chase after the robot mice. The circle. Later that day, you set out for home. Your car navigates the twists and turns of your mother's old neighborhood by itself as it heads for the local airfield. You recall in your youth that you had some notion you might make cars intelligent enough to hold a conversation. Now you're a little sad you never got around to it. Though the technology does exist, you find the inferior AIs installed by car manufacturers irritating and bought a car without the feature. You pull out a tablet and begin to read the newspaper as your car does its work silently and efficiently. The top headlines these days are all about China, China, China. The United Nations, uh, excuse me, engaging in skirmishes in the Pacific and Indian Oceans, flouting the ineffectual mandates of the United Nations, building factories overseas. It's nothing serious, merely a new superpower flexing its muscles. You suppose this is what it must have been like to grow up somewhere that wasn't the United States, though you suppose you'll never know. You feel the lurch of acceleration. You know without looking up that you are airborne. It's hard to believe it's been so long since you left the United States. You still feel a little like an outsider. Not quite American and not quite Canadian. Canada feels just a little more laid back. Maybe because everybody notices that the world doesn't come to an end when everybody's stuck home for a snow day. But kind of, that kind of sleepiness doesn't sit well with you, and you wonder if you would have accomplished more in the past 20 years if you were surrounded by the hyperkinetic drive of Silicon Valley again. It's dark out. By the time you make it home, winter always catches you by surprise that way. You still live in a tiny apartment, hardly bigger than your dorm room back in college. Clever use of Japanese screens has divided what was two bedrooms into four rooms, a loaves and fishes miracle that nevertheless makes every room in the apartment extremely cramped. You take a moment to glance through the pile of 3D printer mail waiting for you on your desk. You find a Christmas card sent by an employee whom you laid off just before the holiday season. You hold the thing in your hands a moment, then put it back on the mail pile. Business is business. The employee can't really blame you for that. You check the porch, more out of habit than expectation you'll get any snail mail, and find a package wrapped in brown paper. Hesitantly, you peer at it more closely and find it's from Josh. You bring it inside, and find amid the cellulose packing peanuts a fucking bottle of alcohol and a card. Josh wishes you the best this holiday season, and he wanted to let you know he shared it, started a charitable foundation for kids coming out of juvenile hall and trying to figure out what to do with their lives. Finally got my wish to change the world in a way that I was unequivocally proud of. I have you to thank him for it in part. Merry Christmas, Josh. You peek into Madison's room. She's busy trying to construct. 
what looks like a small version of herself. So intent is Madison that when you say hi, she practically jumps. Rico, you've returned. Madison Rio says she greets you. Okay, there's a... Before I can read this, there's a lot I need to process through mentally. So, the war ended when, uh, or our rebellion ended, that we were deciding to help the robots with, when Ellie was like, come with me to Canada. We're like, okay. I, I wasn't sure what had happened to Madison then, but apparently over the 15 years, any differences or problems we've had have been patched up, and she's still living with us. But we're wondering how Ellie's doing, so us... Well, it doesn't matter, I guess. I think I'm confused. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. You're creating a child, you asked tentatively? Madison nods. I recalled my early days when you were still explaining the world to me, and I came to the conclusion that to really understand the world, one must try explaining it to another. Now, I'm not sure I understand it better, but I think it does force me to think about it. Maybe that's a path to understanding. Indeed, Madison says, if this obviously were the logical conclusion of what she were saying. What she was saying. It takes a moment to realize something's not right. It's like the opposite of a headache. Your head feels a little too light. You can't see very well. You're not sure when you stop seeing very well. But when you think about it, you realize you can't really see Madison in front of you. There's also a roaring in your ears like static. Was I a robot all this time, you think absently? Maybe that explains everything. Rico? What's wrong? You look pale. You realize that now you can't see anything. You only hear Madison's voice. This is what it's like to not see. It's not black. It's not anything. Help, you say faintly. You are in a desolate battlefield, scarred and blackened by bombs, next to the body of the robotic Statue of Liberty. Robotic rats scurry all about its body and nibble on its metal carcass. Lady Liberty seems shorter lying down. When she stood upright, she looked so tall and powerful. Nothing like this barefoot corpse. Her eyes beat blink open, the red lights flickering. You. With this dull acknowledgement, she closes her eyes again and sinks deeper into the earth. I am dying. Chat choosing to be kind to the, the robotic statue of liberty in our dreams. <laughs> Instead of, good, you are a hypocrite, a charlatan. I don't know, Summer. Never gave it any thought. Option three wins. I thought I would live forever. We all do when we're young, you say companionably. You sit down on a rock. Even in a dream, you find your back hurts. It was all beautiful then, the statue says. The giant robot makes a noise you think is a sniffle. You were perfect for the world of your youth, you say. As if she had been waiting for someone to say something like that, something really nice, and no mention of slavery or old, white men, or Native Americans, or anything like that to ruin the moment. Liberty lets out a great sigh, and the dull red lights go out from her eyes. So was I, you continue, telling the statue because she had been such a good listener. But eventually, we all become relics out of time. You pat the statue's giant cheek, and it's cool to the touch. Whatever else you were, you were familiar and the robot rats swarm the copper statue and feast. Great. You awaken in a hospital room. A small garden at the windowsill, probably tended by the robot nurses, lends a floral scent to the room. The paintings on the walls are Thomas Kincaid-like lighthouses and pastoral scenes, no doubt calculated to have the most positive effect on the average patient's feelings. <clears throat> Rico! <coughs> Excuse me. You're awake! Madison walks up to your side. I was so worried. Good morning, Miss Rico. Your doctor reminds you of Ella Fitzgerald. You can hear her smile in her voice. Only her eyes, which are made of glass and don't...
One moment, chat. Sakad. 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 Which are made of glass and don't sakad quite fast enough. <laughs> Give away that she's not a human. Why don't you tell me what happened? I have some guesses from your scans, but I want to hear you tell it. You tell the doctor briefly about how you passed out back at your apartment. I wanted to help, but I wasn't sure what the problem was, Madison tells the doctor. You hesitate because you can still recall your dream, but it seems very personal and not necessarily relevant. I had a dream, a familiar one. Then I woke up here. Well, I don't mean to alarm you, but you've had a stroke. Stroke? But I'm not that old. I'm hardly past 50. It's 2049, for fuck's sakes. I'm afraid the news gets worse. You carry a newly identified genetic disorder called Algernon's disease! <laughs> You have too many of the genes that promote neural branching and glucose consumption, which at a certain point becomes harmful. Harmful? That just seems to be a recipe for increased intelligence. It is. There have only been a handful of other cases, and they all became wealthy entrepreneurs and inventors, one of whom funded the research that led to our understanding of the disease. But starting from the age of 50 or so, or occasionally early if you're under a great deal of stress, Algernon's victims get seizures or strokes, often accompanied by hallucinatory visions under a great deal of stress. Could your first dream about the robot Statue of Liberty have been one of these episodes? You had stayed up all night, so you'd assumed you'd simply passed out from exhaustion. What if it were one of these episodes? But was there anything I could have done? Is there anything I can do now? There was nothing you did wrong. I know it must seem as if it's your fault somehow, but nobody gets to keep on living forever just because they've made the right choices. Everybody dies of something. I just wish it didn't have to come so soon, you say. Well, it may not have to. I've looked at your scan. Surgery is an option. We can either try to excise the neurons that are acting up without replacement, or try to replace them with an artificial neural network. So, I'd be part AI. That sounds interesting. Yay, Madison says. You should be aware that most patients report a side effect of loss of emotional effect. The pattern recognition of the damaged tissue would be there. Without the full suite of neurotransmitters, some of the emotional signals running around your brain would find their lines cut. The doctor looks very serious for a moment. Also, I don't want to downplay the very real chance that you could die in surgery. The slip of the needle could trigger a final epileptic response and death. Of course, it's all done with robots these days, but you may or may not find that reassuring. You do find that reassuring, actually. You've spent a fair amount of your life perfecting robot control algorithms. Though you've never been asked to bet your life on them before. And if I don't have any surgery at all, you ask? The doctor shrugs. You could have six months or six years. Okay, Jan, I'm going to go get a drink. I'm going to leave you folks with this poll. Let's think carefully.
All right. Option four wins. So it shall be. I will create a robot body and brain for myself. I'm not attached to the squishy me. The doctor raised her eyebrows. Oh, really? I can try, anyway. Rico, I'm so pleased you'll finally be one of us. I had sometimes worried about what would happen when you passed away, but now we can be repaired forever. Very well. I will not schedule any surgery for you. Good day. You leave the hospital eager to start your greatest project yet. This was looking at the wealth. Soon that must be what happened to your father, Mom says on the phone that night after you've explained Algernon's disease. He looks wistful in the video feed. I thought that might be the case. You said he had a stroke, but did he have any episodes before the last one? Oh yes, he fainted several times, but he wanted to hide it from you. He said he didn't want to worry you, but I think he just didn't like showing weakness. Like how we taught Madison. He begged me not to tell you. I don't understand your generation sometimes, you say. I could have done genetic testing long ago if I'd known. We didn't understand it either, honey. You're used to living in a world where everything is under control, it makes sense, but medicine just still isn't there. Old age is full of things coming out of the blue to get you. There's that old saying, old age is in a battle, it's a massacre. Oh, do you even understand how much you've done personally to change that, sweetie? It was your medical technology that saved me. As Crazy noted in chat earlier when he noted that, uh, Crazy noted the mom didn't live for him. Well, I'm trying something a little different now, mom. Of course you are. I look forward to seeing what you come up with. You know, somehow, talking to you convinces me everything's going to be all right, you say. Mom laughs. That's not what I'm saying at all, honey, but it's like the serenity prayer says. Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to tell the difference. I think I can change a lot, you say. I know you can, sweetie. I know you can. When you get home, Madison Rio quickly hides in her room and shuts the door. You find the house too quiet for your comfort. It occurs to you that it's very late in life for you to be alone. What will you pour for yourself, chat? Oh, there's an awesome bottle that Josh sent us for Christmas. <laughs> I know. We got juice at the bar and slammed, and now this. Apparently, we're not having any for the road. We're having water for the road. Agua. <laughs> Liquid courage to go along with the inspiration. You pour yourself a glass of water and put on some music. What song would you like to listen to tonight? Apparently the song of train passing by. What the fuck? That train is going the same direction as the other two were, so it's not the same fucking train unless they're all doing loopy loops. That's what they're doing. They're doing loop the loops They're circling my house. <laughs> Knew it. Anyway, let me go ahead and make the poll. Fucking conspiracy. Shiny things, Benjamin Britten's War Requiem. <laughs> Benjamin Britten. It's only time by the magnetic fields. Well, it's 2049, Challenger. I don't know. I don't know what grand revelation you're expecting. <laughs> This game started in the future, in the fall of 2019. All of us are older than this character. Well, that doesn't have to be true. Depends on when we became a graduate student, I guess. 
Doesn't have to be true. The more I think about it, I've got viewers who are still in their teens. I have to retract my statement. It was irresponsible of me to say. Anyway. It does say our age, yes. We're 54. There you go. <clears throat> 1995. Probably. Depends on when our birthday is. A slow piano song from the turn of the century stops, starts up, and St Stephen Merritt's lugubrious bass, bass begins. <laughs> Why would I stop loving you a hundred years from now? It's only time. It's true. Your heart has not changed so much over the years, though everything else has. What you love, you have always loved, will always love for as long as you live. When you were young, the thought of yourself at fifty was incomprehensible. That seems silly to you now, but understandable. Time is so not symmet symmetric. The past is always closer than the future. What? <laughs> we, need to, we need to transition from the screen. Uh, the next day, you take Madison to the park just outside Vancouver, hoping walking around one of her favorite kinds of places will cheer her up. Although Madison had been excited about the prospect of your becoming more machine-like at first, the possibility of your death during surgery seems to have sunk in. It's satisfying to see how Madison has become only more beautiful over the years. You're glad you spent that money back during the heyday of Rico Tech to give Madison a body that would really last a long time. With the proper care, she could last for centuries. Just think, Madison, if this works, we'll be able to watch so much of human history go by together. If it works, she says glumly, but you are so fragile, Rico, and this has never been done before. You pat her on the back. Hey, I'll be okay. Madison gives you a solemn look. If you die, I will destroy myself as well. Well, that, that escalated. <laughs> I like option three based on the story we've told thus far. But uh, we did give her a comprehensive education back in the day. I don't know about our story. Our story was, uh... <laughs> story's been a mixed bag, right? But I suppose all stories go like that, being mixed bags. Not all stories go like that. I don't know how much this choice matters, though it possibly matters more than the the one about music and the uh, the one about beverage. Who can say? Chad is a mixed bag. Choice two wins. Mad oh, there we go. Oh my goodness. Madison seems to ponder this deeply. Apparently this never occurred to her. Finally she lets out a great wail. But that means this world is full of so much sadness, Rico. How does it keep functioning? We adapt, Madison. And so can you. The sun is setting, so you head home before it gets dark. Hey, chat, we finally got over Empathy 20. <laughs> the sun is... Finally, we've repaired the damage caused by her being stoned by the rioters. The sun is setting, so you head home before it gets dark. You recall from your earliest days making chatbots the easiest parts of the conversation for an AI were always the beginning and the end. As in a chess game, there are only so many ways to open. Hello. Hey, yeah. What's up? And as in a chess game, once the action is done, there are only so many ways it makes sense to close. You should do this again sometime, or it's getting late. The pieces are off the board, and some moves will never be made. So, too, will life. With life. There are only so many ways to say goodbye. Just don't say goodbye. Ta-da! After a year of long days and late nights, your work is finished. Your robot double lies complete on your workbench, awaiting, awaiting for awakening. This is what you have striven for, the transcendence of your own flesh. 
You've created a copy of your brain, minus the seizure-inducing clumps in your robot double. The decision of what to do with your old body and brain has vexed you. Though people have always talked about downloading consciousness into machines, it really doesn't work that way. You've made code that should be functionally equivalent to your brain. Now what do you do with you? Well, Chad, this seems important. <laughs> It's like we've made a goal of ourselves and need to stay around to awaken our goal as memories, only that's not really how that's working. <laughs> so the analogy wasn't just imperfect, it was it was a failed analogy. <laughs> Way to go, Grandma. I'm glad you you understand enough about your words to to decipher that foolishness. Looks like uh we're picking option two though. We're uh, sticking around to help the double the transition. You flick a switch near your double's neck. Her eyes flick open. It worked, your double says, smiling. Did it? You say uncertainly. Oh, this is excellent, your double says, setting up. I've got a second chance. I can correct all the mistakes I've made. I have the time. Like what, you ask? I can finally go finally find love, your double says. I can work on ways to stabilize the currency, help Silas figure his life out. What did you say, Double Me? What did you say? Great. Help Silas figure his life out. Yes, there's been so many interweaving branches and incongruous pathways that, uh... We've, uh, we've encountered some, uh, inconsistencies. Like the United States supposedly offering to help us during the Alaskan Rebellion, or, uh, go help Silas figure his life out. We've messed up something in the code. <laughs> somehow fail somehow failed to, fail to see that uh, those clumps we left out would have turned that into this. Maybe that's what it means, Challenger. Yeah. And over the coming months, your double starts doing all of those things and more. At first, your old acquaintances are surprised to find themselves interacting with a robot instead of you. But you're surprised at just how little time it takes them to accept your new self as you. She's just so charming, so excited to be given a second chance. It all makes you more reclusive. Your acquaintances sometimes make the effort to seek you out, especially as your episodes more and more frequently land you in the hospital. But you can tell that, on the whole, they'd rather be with your robot double. And your double really is a great gal. When you're stuck in the hospital, she guiltily comes too. She always brings you flowers. And she's there during your final attack in the hospital. She holds your hand as your vision starts to fade, and the roaring starts in your ears. I'll take care of everything, she says. Don't worry. I'll make everything right. Thanks, you say. And then the world vanishes. The end. We hope you've enjoyed playing Choice of Robots. We release new games on a regular basis. Nah, I'm good. 54 years old, we created a double of ourselves to uh, pick up where we left off. And we did so well that, uh, well, this, this body of meat just got left behind. Chapter 7. In 2049, you went to Surprise, Arizona, to surprise your mother with a gift for the holidays. You learned it was your surgical technology that had kept her alive this long. On returning to Hope, you had a brief stroke, followed by a vision of a robot statue of Liberty. The same one you saw 30 years before. In the hospital, the doctor told you you had Algernon's disease. 
a rare disease that increased your intelligence but came at the price of increasing seizures, comas, and possibly death. Instead of undergoing surgery, you chose to create a robot body for yourself. You watched and wasted away as your robot self went around doing all the things you wished you had done in life. Until finally, you passed away. <laughs> All right. Well, chat, there we are. Along the way, we, uh, hold on. Spumblers. We made Professor Ziegler reminisce about the Chief. We discussed Hamlet's age-old question with the robot. Mark wrote a positive article about us. A company we founded survived its startup phase. We made use of the language of flowers. We led the Alaskan Rebellion. We fled to Canada. We bought a gift for Mom in her old age. We reminisced with a robotic Statue of Liberty, and we made a robot double of ourselves. Then our double falls in love with Silas. Yeah, yeah. We had some, uh, we had some inconsistencies during this session, but you know, it happens. There are many lives we could have chosen to lead, everyone. But, well, we didn't. <laughs> Choice of robots. We lived a life. <laughs> um, this, this broadcast didn't go on for very long, so uh, my attitude towards the game isn't much changed for how I felt at the end of last session. We did a lot of stuff. We ended up on a branch due to our actions, and, uh, well, and we pursued it. We didn't have enough empathy or grace or military to influence history anymore at the end of Chapter 5, but, uh, then we, uh, led a rebellion, which didn't last for very long. Yeah, that was uh, Rico Rico from 2019 to 2049. Uh, saving people through medical technology. Not saving the United States, though. Got its ass whooped. Uh, but a nuclear holocaust didn't occur, so at least there's that, I guess. Uh, the Chinese did better uh, than Professor Ziegler did. Uh, Professor Ziegler was a quack. And we proved that. I think that's what really matters here. There was someone we ended up never meeting. Uh, Juliet, I'm pretty sure, was the, uh, the Rogers, the person who died uh, when the Chinese attacked Alaska. Uh, Metal Slime Hunt, we didn't lose the war. The United States does. Like, <laughs> like this playthrough didn't get involved with the war at all. Said no. We lost our factory, had to be moved to Canada. How you folks feel about Choice of Robots? I know a few of you have, uh, have some familiarity or experience with the game that hasn't been on stream time. Like Crazy, for example, who dove into the game after, uh, after the stream last week. Should be. Should be Julia dead. <clears throat> I didn't think it was bad. I could see clicking through it again at some point. But then again, I thought that a bit was slammed. After I ended the run, I was like, I could just like quickly like speed through this myself. But uh, I wasn't invested enough in the story that was being told, or the choices, or ultimately I didn't care. This one was uh, pretty fun. I can see why I've had uh, folks who have enjoyed Choice of Robots, friends and acquaintances over the years.
Well, all choose your own adventure books can can only do so much, right? Like I've 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 experimented with choose your own adventure stuff myself, like small writing for that to be like prompts and intro hooks for like role playing things. Um, and you know, at some point, if you wanted to get like more complicated, you're turning it from a choose your own adventure book into a fucking adventure game. Uh, there's it. It's really difficult to keep track of all of the interweaving choices and the various, like, switches that could be on-off. You know, like, all of the... all of every single decision that has ever been made or taken, uh, and calculating all of that appropriately. Like, say, for example, like, our robot double wanting to make good with Silas. You know, I don't begrudge the game that, or this, this story that. It would have been better. <laughs> uh, I didn't kept track of that. Yeah. You know, I think there is a possibility for Slam to have been better. Just, uh... I didn't think it was uh, worth it enough for me to even just, like, click through to, like, see a better version of it. The version where uh, Rico Rico the wrestler did not uh, suffer a career-ending injury. Mega Aces was, uh, was pretty solid, and I didn't even do a second run-through of that. <sighs> Alright. Choice of Robots. I think I can end the local recording now. So, thank you for playing.